Today we're speaking with Gary Langford, Professor Emeritus from the University of Florida in Gainesville. I understand you're originally from Pennsylvania. Can you take us on the journey from Pennsylvania to Florida? Certainly. I was born and raised in a small town in northeastern Pennsylvania, right below the New York State line called Susquehanna, Pennsylvania. And it was right on the banks of the Susquehanna River. Uh, I was born there along with, I have one sister and two brothers. Uh, my dad was the local undertaker. He also had a furniture store and a bottle gas business because there was no natural gas up there. They're fracking now, but they didn't back then in the 40s. And uh, my mom was a graduate of the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. So all of us kids, when we reached the fourth grade, uh, well, even before the fourth grade, we started piano lessons with my mom. And then we got the fourth grade in uh, uh, Susquehanna. We all took a band instrument. My sister, who was the oldest, took the mellophone. I, of course, took the king of the instruments, the trumpet. My next brother took uh, the saxophone, unfortunately. And my youngest brother took the oboe. Uh, we all took piano lessons with my mom and then continued. I've taken piano lessons for probably 26 years, all through college and graduate school. So, uh, graduate from Susquehanna University. Uh, in the summers, I would go to a music camp called Beaverbrook Music Camp in the Pocono Mountains, uh, right around uh, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. And there's where I met a very, very important person in my life, uh, Professor Alan W. Flock who was the instrumental director of the music camp. And so he talked me into, uh, after my senior year, I went there and he talked me into becoming a music major at Bucknell. So I went through Bucknell and got my Bachelor of Science in Music Education. Then uh, I, during that time, my senior year, I'd auditioned for a lot of the service bands and was accepted into the, the uh, Air Force Band in Washington, D.C. But in the meantime, I had applied for officer training school, and I was accepted for that. So when that came about, I went to officer training school uh, rather than going to the band in D.C., thinking that, well, maybe maybe I could become a, a conductor or something like that. But unfortunately, there were no slots uh, in music career fields in the Air Force at that time. So it was my contention that became that because music began with M and maintenance began with M, <laughs> they put me in aircraft maintenance officer. <laughs> so that led me to uh, officer, or I mean, after I got done with OTS, that led me to aircraft maintenance officer school in Rantoul, Illinois, which is just very close to uh, Champaign-Urbana. So on my off-duty time, I would go down there and play with, with their jazz bands and things like that. So, so that's that part of the story. Then I got, uh, I finished aircraft maintenance officer school, and I, I'm not the, the best with tools and things like that. So it was very fortunate that I was an officer, and I said, well, Sergeant, fix the airplane or something like that. And he would <laughs> fix it, and then I'd, I'd sign the paperwork. So then I, I got stationed at Oklahoma City. In Oklahoma City, uh, I kept my chops up by playing with the Oklahoma City University Jazz Band. And so everything was fine. Then um, one day, uh, something came in the mail uh, at the office and I was assigned to uh, Vietnam. So I went over there for a year with the uh, 352nd and the 480th Tactical Fighter Squadron. And then I came back and taught junior, senior high school in Oklahoma City for two years, I think it was. It's so long ago, I can't really remember. So it was at least two years. And so it, uh, one of the things that I did was I took my jazz band there from the high school to various festivals, and that's when I heard the North Texas State 1 o'clock lab band. And so I, of course, became uh, enthralled with that and then ended up down there uh, at North Texas State pursuing my master's degree in trumpet performance. Not necessarily jazz, but this was classical trumpet with John Haney. Uh, I ended up in the one o'clock uh, uh, lab band with people like uh, uh, Blue Lou, which is Lou Marini, and uh, Bones Malone, and they were in the, in the um, Blues Brother band. Uh, and so I did that for two years, got my degree, and then uh, 
during one of my last semesters there, a student from Florida, Henry Wolkane, who had a wonderful career at the University of Utah, played trombone. He came in and he ended up in my two o'clock band. And he said, listen, I think there's a gig that you might be interested in at the University of Florida. So uh, I came down and auditioned, interviewed for the job. It was professor of trumpet, uh, concert band, uh, marching band, uh, arranging. And so that, that was in 1971. And the rest of it is history. So I've been there since 1971, and that was my initial, uh, the initial job description was, was, was what I just said. And that's what got me from, from Pennsylvania through Oklahoma, through Vietnam, uh, through Illinois to, to Florida. And of course, I've been here since 1971 and s supposedly retired in 2007, although I'm still going in every morning at 7 o'clock because I'm emeritus professor which means you're old <laughs> and the only thing was that you get it you get a free parking sticker and the second thing is that I still do have an office there that, just because there happens to be a an empty office I'm sure when something comes along and, and there's a a real professor that wants to do real work I'll, I'll get booted but that's that's in a nutshell you know how I'm, how I'm here well I would certainly be remiss if I didn't pause at this moment and thank you for your service um, we certainly appreciate your, your patriotic contributions. Well, thank you. Thank you. I was in four years, five months, and 21 days. Wow. Somehow that sticks in my mind. And I, would, mm -hmm. I, I, I made it to the rank of captain. And then when I, right when I got back from Vietnam, I, that's when I got out and, and, uh, and went into teaching. Now, sometimes I kick myself just, just a teeny bit because I would have had 20 years in, in 83 because I was commissioned in 63 and could have had, this is what, 2014, so 93, so could have had a whole nother career. But anyway, that's just a little kick. I'm sure there are students whose lives you touched in those years when you weren't in the military that would disagree with your uh, opinion that maybe you should have stayed. I'm sure they're glad you didn't, so that well, you were available. I'm glad too. I mean, it's been absolutely wonderful teaching. Well, during your career, um, since you spent so much of it at the University of Florida in Gainesville, what were some pivotal moments or pivotal people that helped you along the way? Well, I'll go back and talk about Flocky, Alan W. Flock. Um, he was my trumpet professor. He was my college band director. Uh, he, he ran Beaverbrook for 10 years. Let's see. Let me back up. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> um, after I got to Florida in 71 for like at least 10 years, I went to Bucknell every fall and in the space of a week taught all of them, taught their band um, four shows in the space of a week. And so we had that connection and we had that connection until he passed away in, in 2006. But he was the one that, well, let me back up even further. Do, 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 do. My dad, I guess you would say, was a workaholic. And a lot of Sundays he was down at the store doing paperwork and everything. So, so the musical side came from my mom. Mm -hmm. uh, the work ethic and how to treat people uh, definitely was not, I don't want to say influence, but my dad, there's, there's always the... the the uh, stereotype of the friendly undertaker. <laughs> Dad was extremely outgoing and, and, and very personable and yada, yada, yada. Treated people just absolutely fairly. Uh, bent over backwards to help people if they, were, if they were a little destitute or whatever, that kind of thing. So, so that, that work ethic was, was instilled in me very, very early on. And that certainly is, has been a a major factor in any kind of success that I've had. So my dad and my mom, Flocky, uh, uh, from the college standpoint and conducting and and imbuing in me, instilling in me, uh, you know, that love of of music because because he was very much he he also did the um, conducted the Bucknell Women's Chorale or or some choral organization. 
He also conducted the Baptist Church in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania for like 25 years or something. So he was in all of these kind of, of things, uh, major requiems and, and in, the, in the standard literature of the day and of course the standard trumpet literature that I had to play in his studio. And then um, during all the years when I went to Bucknell that I was at Beaverbrook as a counselor or as the camp director uh, eventually. And just just being being around somebody that was so into music and into teaching, regardless of what the situation was, regardless of what the, what the the ensemble was, regardless of the locale that it was. I mean, this was a little a little music camp in the middle of the Poconos that that. That maybe that maybe the the concert band was forty five people or something like that, and they're doing doing major literature uh, uh, during a six week period uh, during the summer. Uh, so so that I still think of him and, and still thank him for all of the all of the those things that influenced me just by being around him. In other words, this is, it's the same thing that that. You know, role models. We keep talking about role models. And he was a wonderful role model. Not by what he did. And it's not like you get up and you say, okay, I'm going to be a role model. It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, you need to be at, at school at 7 o'clock. You need to stay there till 10 o'clock at night. You need to get this done. You need to get this done. Blah, 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 blah. And that stuff happens automatically. And I think with most really successful ensemble or band directors or choral directors whatever orchestra doesn't make any difference that's that's part of the gig it is not 2 30 we're done you know your class is over go home no uh and that's one thing that anyone who's going to get into this business has to has to under understand so to make a short story long those are probably the most influential uh until i got to florida and then, of course, I'm getting a chill just in here. Well, I know Florida Bandmasters has been a very important part of your life. Yeah. And the membership and the friendships and networking that are available through that have been important. When I got to Florida... Uh, just being around two amazing people in Dick Bowles and Reed Poole. And for me to be inducted into the role of distinction with people like that, and Colonel Bachman, who I only met, I met when I interviewed in the spring of 71. He passed away in the spring of 71 on the podium. I mean, that's when he had the heart attack on the podium. He finished the concert. He went to the hospital and passed away with the Georgia All-State Junior High Band. But those, those, just to see, and of course, that, that was a, a totally different time in the 70s, the early 70s, middle 70s. But those two gentlemen, as far as like, just absolutely salt of the earth, gentlemen that, 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 were so concerned with students learning and students' abilities and taking them from here to there and 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 making sure that I knew my responsibilities to the profession. I remember Dick telling me, you know, at some point University of Florida is going to forget about you. But the profession will not. He was very much a part of, of FBA, as was was Reed, you know, because Reed was with Colonel Bachman, his assistant, and then Reed moved up to director of bands, and then Dick came in as his assistant. Then when Reed went to the chairmanship, he's the one who hired me. Then Dick became the director of bands, and Robert Foster became the assistant director of bands, professor of trumpet. He's, his position is the one that I took over in 71. Of course, uh, Bob Foster went on to a, a great career at the University of Kansas. So those... Those people I think about every day because it's hard to find it's hard to find people with that kind of heart these days. But Reed and, and, and Dick were just like 
and not so much the colonel because I didn't know the colonel. Uh, but but while I was at Florida, I mean, those two just 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 were an inspiration all the time. So those are probably the most important. Yeah. Well, I hope you also realize what an inspiration you are to others in the in the field. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you. you. Truly are. So you have absorbed many things from those fine gentlemen. Well, thank you. That means a lot. You mentioned earlier some things that you were hoping young directors would take into account as they were launching their careers. Um, do you have other words of wisdom or advice? Oh, I have tons of it. <laughs> and the, the interview has to be over like in 30 minutes, right? Okay, so let's see if I can pare this down. Um, um, it seems like an, an obvious thing, but you have got to be, you have got to love music. You've got to love teaching. And those, those loves lead you to the work ethic, the, um, the professionalism, the, the always striving to be better. If you don't have those, forget it. I mentioned work ethic. The, the, I, I shudder to think what directors go through now. Because when I taught high school, which was 68 and 69, I mean, who was alive then? Uh, that's, that's the dark ages. And what, what teachers in general have to go through, classroom teachers, it's even worse because they gotta be there. Band, choral, orchestra, things like that. They want to be there. You're not necessarily forcing a kid to, to be in your, your, your jazz band or something like that. But, um, lost my train of thought. Um, um, what were we talking about? You were doing integrity. You were doing work ethic and advice to young directors. You were saying how the love of music and the love of teaching leads you to the work ethic. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. I'm just trying to compare back then with now because because there's so many more things, number one, that kids can get involved in or even good things that, that are tugging them uh, away from your program. Uh, and then just the incredible testing and scheduling and, and yes, I was going to have all my kids together next year and then they tell me, okay, well, no, the only time you can have your kids together is after school or something. Things that, that, that are driven by things that have nothing to do with music. Uh, it could be administration, it could be the legislature, it could be whatever. And so, uh, if, you don't, if you don't have that dedication to it, you're not going to last very long. And we see, you and I have seen directors that three years, four years, that's it. You know, I can't, I can't. Uh, they want me to be out there every weekend in the fall competing and they want me to be done, 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 done and here I'm burned out and, and I'm not seeing my family enough and, and so the pressures on a director now and teachers in general are much more than back in the day. They just are. Um, so if you don't have that dedication to the kids and to the music you're only going to last so long because you're not going to get monetary reward. It's not like okay, I put in, I put in, uh, uh, I put in seventy hours this week. So what? You know, this is your salary. You know, okay, uh, uh, you know, and and you can get out and okay, you get a job in in industry or something like that where you're putting in seventy hours a week and it's and it's paying you monetarily and we all know that teachers are not getting paid what they're supposed to be paid or what their job entails and 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 so if you don't have that and it's not driving you then then you're not going to last that's certainly great advice well let's talk about character personal characteristics of yourself and the things that you hope to instill in your students that help both uh, the ensemble and the individual achieve greatness. Okay. 
25 words or less. Love of music. Period. I'm 73 years old. This is my 42nd year with the Gator Band. In some shape or form. Actually, now I just do a little arranging for it. And once a year, they let me stand on the ladder and, and do alumni <laughs> band. And then they have three or four people at the bottom of the ladder to catch me in case I fall off. Uh, uh, but I was thinking about this. Um, music never lets you down. There's always some music that's going to affect you, affect your audience, etc. To, to, to express joy, to help you get through a... a a sad time, etc., 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 and even even now, as many years as I've been involved, and the, and this applies to anyone uh, that is still around, that has this love of music. They're still discovering a new composer, a new work, uh, a new a new young kid that just just you know. We had an international piano camp in Florida at the beginning of the summer. And I went to the final concert, and there's these kids that are 13, 14, 15, 16 years old playing playing piano pieces that, that I couldn't even begin to, to do and just playing them fantastically. And just just discovering that and knowing that, that that's out there. And so it's, it's never like, okay, we're retired and I was a musician and okay, yada, yada, yada. I'm... Uh, I'm conductor of the Gainesville Community Band. Dr. Jerry Poe just retired from that. I go co-conducted Gainesville Pops with Dr. Steve Bingham. I conduct a um, group of retirees at Oak Hammock. Uh, these are the people that played in college and high school and, and hadn't touched their instruments like in 50 years. So I've got like one cello, three flutes, two clarinets, uh, two violins. But they, they just want to participate. Uh, then I'm playing in a rock band, and I've got a, 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 a jazz band that reads every other Sunday. So, so for me, it's just, it's, there's no way that I cannot do that stuff. So that love of music and, and that excitement that, that when you discover something or, or, example, yesterday for lunch. I had lunch with Mark Wood, who is, is the lead uh, trumpet player in the, the uh, Army Blues, who w went through my program in the, I'm going to say, the, the late 80s. And just, I get so fired up talking to him because he's in that band in Washington, D.C. He's playing with, with, with just incredible players that are still inspiring him and we get to talk trumpets, and we get to talk bands, and we get to talk what it's like being in the Beltway, and and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that that never goes away. And if it goes away, it it uh, there. I don't think there's any way you can fake that. That that I always I always told. I forget who I told, but anyway, you can't fool the kids. And and if you're not this way or if, if you're this way they see through that as opposed to if if you're really really um, doing things in their interest and and explaining and, and doing the correct teaching rather than blowing them off or or whatever the, the, the kids if, if any professor thinks that that they're putting something over on the kids today I don't think they are I think the kids the, the kids know um, so that, that love of music is, is, is just paramount. And we already talked about work ethic. If you don't have that, you're not going to, or let's put it this way, it's going to be, you're going to be, uh, I don't want to use the term successful because sometimes that equates with, well, how many trophies do we have on the wall? And that's, you know, trophies are okay, but they got to be the icing on the cake. And you don't do things to get a trophy. You do th or an award, you do things because the music demands it, or your teaching philosophy demands it. Did you want to take a student from from A to B, or L to Z, or anything like that? Uh, and perchance, if they happen to win a competition, or you take your ensemble to wherever, uh, I forgot to mention, for over 25 years, I've been the conductor of the Lester County Youth Orchestra, which is, which is, 
which is so so great for me. I'm I'm working with strings, and so we go to Disney a couple years ago, and they 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 took every award under the sun. We never talk about that or anything. It's like okay, this you put the CD on of Chicago, and you listen to it, and then you try and get those kids to 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 sound as close as they can based upon their their abilities at that time, and the fact that you quote unquote won something is is just a result of of trying to make the music sound like it's supposed to sound. It's supposed to be in tune. It's supposed to be rhythmic. It's supposed to be balanced. It's supposed to be all these things. And that's what what you constantly have to shoot for. And I don't care. And I've said this many, 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 many times. <laughs> uh, I don't care whether it's volleyball band, the first jazz band at UF, or the fourth jazz band when we had four jazz bands, or wind symphony, or or... It's music, and it's not like, well, mm, since you're in jazz band, we're, we don't need to tune as, as much, or you don't need to play as well in tune as the, as the concert band or the marching band or something like that. It, it's all, to me, it's all the same. You're either out of tune or you're in tune or you're not maintaining the proper tempo or, or things like that. And those, if you, let, if you let the musical parameters drive what you're trying to do with your students, you're always going to be okay. It's it's you to to reduce what you do as a music educator to what three judges tell you at state contest or at Disney or at all these these marching things that you go to it is not is not the purpose of it at all. Now the purpose of, of getting that evaluation is to bring the students to a little higher level that they don't know they, they can attain. And of course, you and I know very well that a lot of times what these judges are telling your students, it's the same stuff you told them a million times. But for some reason, when we bring in a Professor Langford or I bring in somebody from New York to play with a jazz band and they, and they say, well, it was a little too loud there. Duh. You know, you've told them... Oh, oh, this guy's from New York. He he must he must be like you know. So so I've always tried to treat all of that the same based upon based upon your situation. And it's an, that's another thing that that young directors need to understand. Some directors go to college. They graduate, they get the first job, a couple of things. Uh, they haven't done marching band, they haven't done marching in a year, and I don't want to do that, I want to, I just want to do wind symphony and blah, 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 blah. So what's the first thing that hits them in August? They got a new marching band. They've only had one year experience, and and uh, who knows if they've had a good uh, uh, methods course, like, what do you mean I got to order, order all this music by tomorrow? What do you mean? I got uh, uniforms. Uh, uh, uh. That's number one. Number two is um, what was I talking about? You're talking about the situation. No, oh, oh, okay. Yes, yes. They'll get out and they'll they'll program what they played in college. <laughs> and they're at East Cupcake Middle School. And duh, <laughs> duh. And that 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 is a fault of our system. I remember, and I, I and I remember when when Dick taught methods and everything. You had to you had to, okay. Here's your assignment for Thursday. It's Tuesday. Here's your assignment for Thursday. I want you to give me a program of, of, of grade ones, grades twos, and grade threes. Oh, I never played a grade one tune. Well, you better you better know how to to. Research that stuff because if you don't, here's another one of my 25 words or less. This is, the key to success for most of everything is literature. Absolutely. That's, that, whether that people believe that or not, I don't really care because it's always worked for me because maybe you don't have an oboe this time or maybe you have this or maybe you have that. 
And you, if you don't, if you don't have the kids play the music that that they can aspire to, and be successful at, which is which is tricky sometimes because you've got this disparity between your top players are here, and we've got some kids here. Mm, well, you've got to find a way to to bring it all together so that they can be successful performing the music you put in front of them. So that literature thing is critical. I mean. You get out, okay, let's do the Hindemith Symphony. Uh, uh, uh. Or in your situation where you're talking about middle school, unless you're student teaching in a good middle school with a director that has their head on straight and knows the literature, you're not going to get experience doing that. And you need to have it because, okay, I need a job. Oh, okay, you want to do band and choral. Choral? What's that? That's singing. And, and and not that not that everyone needs to be absolutely totally prepared to teach all of that stuff, but but in this day and age where programs are getting slashed right and left and fewer ensembles and yada yada yada, that that might be the what you end up. Or okay, you can do band and math. Or mm -hmm. boom 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 boom. So it's it's not an easy gig uh, at all. But back to that literature. If you don't if if you don't have the right literature, you can, you can, anyone can pick literature to make a, a group sound bad. That's very easy. It's very easy to do. So the trick is to find the literature that they, they buy into that is a little bit above them. Uh, here again, about the situation. If, you, if you're doing your, your three tunes for a festival, that's one thing. But if you if you got to program your whole Christmas concert, yada, yada, yada. Well, we've almost come to the end of our half hour together. Can you tell me one short story? You had an interesting one about the, your time with the Gator Band. <laughs> one short story. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, let's see if I can condense this. Uh, in 1995, I, I relinquished the directorship of the marching band. I had served uh, uh, with them for 25 years. 25 years I did all the arrangements. The last 10 was as a director. Other than that, I was the assistant director and arranger and kind of stuff like that. The last game that that I was at the helm of the Gator Band was 1995 when we went to the Fiesta Bowl and played Nebraska and got killed. The O-line could not protect Danny. He got Danny Werfel. He just got killed all the time. And when I... <laughs> When I'd go to, to convention after that, people like uh, um, uh, Patrick Dunnigan would come up to me and say, hey, I think Nebraska just scored again. <laughs> I mean, talk about rubbing it in. But anyway, uh, so those were 25 really, really great years. Uh, and there are a lot of stories, uh, many of which I can't remember, but there's one that I really remember. Uh, every year, of course, we play Georgia in the in the Jacksonville in the in the what do they used to call that the Gator Bowl. Okay, uh, and the Georgia band always had a uh, electric bass and a big speaker that they put up in the stands, and that was what what drove the band rather than the tubas and stuff like that. Well, it drove us crazy. I mean, it was so you can't compete with, doom, 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 boom, 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 you know, just mm -hmm. so, so. <laughs> I forget what year it was, but um, I'm down on the sideline waiting to go on, and and somebody comes up to me. I don't remember exactly how this happened, but someone had cut the plug off of the cord that went to their their base rig in the stands. Oh, not just unplugged it. They no. actually severed it. Oh, choom, like that. And and the policeman or somebody came up to me and, and, and started to get on me or something like that. And I just said, listen, no, 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 no. We don't necessarily agree with the fact that they're allowed to play that, but my kids would never do that. Mm -mm, mm -mm. No, no, no. So we got done with the game and blah, 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 blah. Come to find out that one of the trombonists had done exactly that. Oh. And 
And how did you come to find that out? Because <clears throat> they turned it into an award. <laughs> an award that I do nothing about. I have seen it because it's out there on Facebook or something like that. And it's a plaque. And this plug with part of the cord is attached to the plaque. And then there are all these little, little name, pla name plates that, that has the, the name of, of, I don't know how they pick it, but anyway, that's how I found out. And, and to this, I mean, I, it's like yesterday that I was just saying, no, there's no way a Gator Band student would do that. No, no, no. <laughs> And of course, it had to be a trombonist. Okay, we all know about trombones. You know, who was it that was it Mahler or somebody? Don't look at the trombones; it just encourages them. You know that famous quote. <laughs> so that that's um, that was one of the the funnier things it, in retrospect. Uh, there are a lot of other little stories, but probably that that's the one we should uh, use for the interview. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. And now it truly is time to say bye-bye. And thank you for your time and, and for sharing your thoughts with us. You're very, very welcome. Thank you.